I was out in LA for nine months. I was struggling as an artist, um, getting odd jobs here and there. I had $6.86 left in my account. No can't way. call home, can't ask for money, got to make it on your own. And um, I went to this audition. There was over 400 girls there. They're looking for two girls and myself and my roommate at the time booked the job. And that was what started my dance career, truly, because the choreographer kind of took me in, introduced me to a lot of incredible choreographers that when I got off tour, I was able to start auditioning and they knew me from, oh, you just did that other tour? Yeah, yeah. And then it just escalated. And But, you know, it's one of those things where that moment was the pivotal moment in my career. And had I not stuck it out, I could have potentially just said, all right, this isn't for me. Because I hear a lot of people say, give it a year. Sometimes it takes longer than a year. You gotta believe in yourself. You gotta know that like tomorrow you could get a call that could change the course of your career. And you have to have faith in that and not give up on yourself, you know? I'm Dr. Larry Bruchette, and as I see every day in the ER, life can change in a moment. On this show, we tell the stories that matter most, after which we are never the same. We have a wonderful guest for you today, Rachel Markarian, actress, dancer, and master teacher. Yes. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Wait a minute, what is a master teacher? Uh, so master teacher, the way I like to define it, is in the dance world, somebody who's had a very lucrative or versatile career as a dancer and potentially worked in multiple areas and is now sharing that knowledge and that passion with the younger generation. So I've been teaching now for, I wanna say, six or seven years on a platform a little bit bigger the last two years I've been teaching on a convention, which is like studios from all across the world come in Oh, I wow. have up to hundreds of kids in my classes. I'm teaching on a really big scale. And then I also... This is like Tony Robbins events. Kind of, yeah, for the dance world, yeah, 100%. So we go to... Um, the convention I teach on is called Energy Dance Project. We're going into our 10th season this coming year, 2020. This will be my second full year with them. We're going to go to about 12 cities all across the country. Oh, wow. And yeah, so say we're in North Carolina, all surrounding studios from North Carolina that want to attend that convention, they'll come in ages four to like 20 years old. What do they come in? I mean, what gets them to the convention? That... They drive, they fly in. Um, they're, they come in so they can take class from multiple master teachers like myself. So the days oh. are filled from like 8 a.m. until 3 in the afternoon, every hour on the hour. They're taking a different class with a different master teacher. I see. And then come 4 o'clock on, they're in competition. So then they're competing. Oh. And we're judging and we're, we're running scholarship um, auditions for them. So they're learning. They're slowly learning at a young age what it's like to be... Um, you know, kind of in the professional, pre-professional dance world, what an audition is like, what it's like to get cut, what it's like to get close and not oh, get it or potentially get it. I know, it. I was thinking I like know, the competition that. thing that's yeah. so harsh, but real. Yeah. It's so real. So, um, and they compete for awards and scholarship money and all that stuff within their studio. Mainly so kids? It's teenagers. ages four to like 18 or 20. Okay. Yeah. So. Men and women? Women? Yeah. Got boys and girls, yeah. We so get a whole mixed bunch. You're one of there's a handful like, of master teachers at this conference. Yeah, there's about 15 master teachers on my convention, but there's probably, I mean, I would say, I don't even know, probably like 40 conventions that do this yearly. Okay. And our season is like January to June or July. We do like a big national. So convention. you travel a lot. Yeah, you? it's every weekend. Yeah. Okay. I don't necessarily travel every weekend, but I do. A circus. fair share. Yeah, yeah. So what is your, you're one of these master teachers. Uh -huh. What, which type of dance do you teach? So I do lyrical or I do a jazz or I do a heels class. I kind of just tell the director of our convention, like, put me where you need me. Um, I'm not one of those teachers that's like super specific. I only teach hip hop or I only teach ballet, you know. Um, I'm pretty versatile. So they kind of just put me wherever they need me, which is nice. So I'm going to... I love lyrical, though. It's like my fave. I'm going to ask you about lyrical. I'm yeah. going to relate to you as a brother of a dance. My oh, sister, okay. I mean, she did tap and jazz yeah. and yeah. about, you know, all these things when she was a kid. And mm -hmm. I watched her perform and all that stuff. Yeah. And, but I've never, I don't, lyrical, I don't know what that is. And then, I always tell dancers, like the younger ones, I always say, raise your hand if you've ever taken a, a lyrical class before. Sometimes they do or they don't. I always say it's a fusion of like ballet and jazz. 
fused together. So it's like soft and beautiful lines with a little bit of power behind it. But at the same time... It's almost like I want you to demonstrate it. <laughs> I know. Almost. No. There's content. I have content on my website and Instagram and stuff like that. I'll but, look up lyrical on But li Instagram. like dance is so subjective, you know? Like what somebody views as contemporary might feel very modern for somebody else, which is very cool because... And I think that's why it's so great as younger dancers to be exposed to master teachers because everybody has a different perspective in a different style and the more they can expose themselves to that the better and stronger they're going to be as artists and human beings and because I think what we teach is beyond steps in choreography at least in my classes I try to teach them about you know storytelling and intention and um, you know the, the why behind why they're doing a lot of their movement and things like that or hard work and commitment it's just like all these things infused that are life lessons that we can have them incorporate while they're in class, if that makes sense. Yeah, like a deeper understanding yeah. of what yeah. they're doing and mm -hmm. what it means. Totally, yeah. So they can just be deeper artists, richer artists, more mindful. I'm intrigued. Yeah. Not much of a dancer myself, <laughs> but it I have two does... older brothers, and they're like, she got all the rhythm in the family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you again for coming. Yeah. We connected at Bethany London's book launch yes how fun was that I she's know. coming she's on so the show sweet. i know very i love soon her too i've known her for a few years now so i'm really proud that she's got her book and she's doing that whole thing we're going to be talking about it shortly yeah, yeah. um uh, so i'm curious about your moment i feel like i've had a lot of moments do you mean moments in life or moments in career or mm -hmm. We typically like to pick um, a moment that you want to talk about, but yeah. in your life that is a moment when your life changed or when the trajectory, you thought it was going this way and there was a pivotal point and then yeah. it went another way and then just kind of get into that, you know, for you and what it yeah. meant and what it felt like. And sure. Um, I don't know if anything comes to mind. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple. I mean, on a personal note, when I was 18, I lost my father, unfortunately. So that mm. kind of put everything in perspective. It kind of forces you to ask yourself, like, am I happy where I'm at? What do I want to be doing? It kind of like gives you a little bit of a sense of urgency. Mm. Um, and I was in college at the time. I was a freshman and I was studying dance and I was going to school in Oklahoma City University and I was coming out here during my semesters off and I was training out here and trying to audition and work and kind of get my footing here in LA. Where are you from? I'm from Boston. Okay. Yeah. Um, how did you end up in Oklahoma? I know. I'm from Everybody's Kansas City. Like, I'm from how Kansas, did that so I'm like um, You don't look like an Oklahoma. So, I know. No offense. Um, so I grew up <laughs> in Boston, got all my training there. I lived in New York when I was fifteen on my own, was on a scholarship out there at a professional studio and always wanted to be on Broadway. Like I was like that's, I don't want to be a ballerina, but I want to dance on Broadway. That's my thing. And um, Oklahoma City had a really good musical theater department. So I was able to like do my acting, my music, my dancing. I went to a performing arts high school, so it was like a perfect fit. And I liked the slow pace because I was just being, you know, surrounded by the city all the time. I liked like a calmer pace of Oklahoma. I liked the idea of the friends and, you know, a slower way of living. So I was going to say contrasted by New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also just the, you know, as a kid growing up and training and everything was go, 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 that I just wanted to kind of drop in and just have an easier way of, of being and of life. And that's what Oklahoma was like. And then I got offered a scholarship out here. And that's kind of what introduced me to Los Angeles and the commercial dance world that I didn't even know existed. Um, I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place here now, but in, in between my summers off and that happening when I was 18, I was kind of like, where do I want to be? What do I want to be doing? And I wasn't necessarily super happy in college. And I was getting offers out here to come and, you know, sign with an agency and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so just one day I was like, life is now. I'm going to move to L.A. And um, for nine months, it was like a very big struggle. You know, I was 20 years old. My mom was like, I'll support you. Like, emotionally and spiritually pretty much but she's like you're in the real world so don't ask me for anything kind of thing no money no nothing yeah and I don't blame her because I'm one of you know three kids and she's a single mom and you know and so I worked really hard and I saved what I thought was enough which everybody does when they come out here and then they realize in like two months that 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 it's like nothing. is nothing yeah um but I really wanted to just only work in my industry and I didn't want to get a a waitressing job or mm. a side job or anything. Um, 
and not that I don't believe in that because I come from a family of like extreme hard workers, you know, yeah. my mom held down several jobs and um, growing up, I just never wanted to be distracted by anything that wasn't in my world, you know, so I only wanted to make my living with my art. Um, and it was like nine months of just like auditioning and not getting anything or getting one little job and hoping that money would last for, you know. Um, and then nine months in, I, I remember I had like $6.86 in my bank account and my rent was due and there was a audition for a tour with this big Latin artist. And uh, there was like 400 girls at the audition. They, they only needed two. And Thankfully, myself and my roommate ended up booking. You were the two. We were the two. Out yeah, she was my roommate at the time. Yeah, and I had to call my agency and ask them for an advance and everything. But that was the moment where my career changed. It was that tour that the choreographer who took a chance on me. She kind of like nurtured me a little bit, introduced me to other <clears throat> choreographers, and by the time I got off that tour two years later, it was a very not a very easy career for me, but. That was the thing that was like, oh, this is... That if, got you to the next level. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Door. Yeah, yeah. It, she introduced me to quite huge Emmy-winning choreographers that were doing films and TV shows. And, um, you know, it was just like one thing after the other. And I also think I came up as a dancer at a very different time versus now coming up as a dancer. I think it's a whole other, it's a whole other thing with social media and all the things. Mm. Yeah. Let, so, let's go back to this. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm jumping all over the place. No, this is great. There's yeah. a lot of things I want to dig into. Okay, cool. Um, the first thing that pops into my mind is two out of 400. I know. That's 0.5%. That's mm -hmm. less than 1%. That's ridiculous. Yeah, but that's what that's what it's like. That's the game. Yeah, and I still go to auditions. And I'm, I've been in this game now for 17, January, it'll be 17 years. And I still audition and I'll still be like, oh, I'm number 506, okay. You know, but like, or, or it's like, hey, Rachel, so-and-so is asking if you're available for this job or whatever, you know? Yeah, it's, don't you, do, it's do, both. You, do you have some where you're, you get to a level and, and I feel like in acting, that's yeah, definitely you get little... offers and, yeah. Um, but most still most of my twenties, it was all direct bookings, which is the choreographer, or the director calls your agency, asks if you're available. If you are, you do it. You know, they know you. Yeah, and, what you and you've can do worked and, with them, and yeah. um, and it's good because if you get kind of a handful of choreographers that you've worked with multiple times, that's really all you need to stay consistently working. I see. You know, because um, if they're working, yeah, yeah, if they're working all the time and you, they <clears> trust <throat> you and you deliver for them and you're right for the job, chances are they're going to keep asking you to come back. So it's like the the process is, you know, you have to be at a certain level. You got to be yeah. good enough. Yeah. And then you get out and then you just audition until you get mm -hmm. lucky, until you get your opportunities. Yeah. yeah. And I talk to a lot of young dancers, and not super young, but they're in their early 20s and they've been out here for like a few years and they're still pounding the pavement. They're waiting for that like thing. Yeah. And now that I've been in it for so long, it's like I always want to tell them, I'm like, you're doing all the right things. Like staying consistent, staying on top of your training, putting in the work. But yeah. on the flip side of that, your life has to mean more than a job. And so that's a what whole... What do you mean? Like, I think as artists... Don't put your self-esteem and everything yeah, into something yeah. you may not... Don't put your self-worth into whether or yeah. not you get this job or not because there's so much rejection in my industry. Yeah, and there's... And you have to you have to have a good sense of, of who you are as a human and what you're doing in life outside of your work because if your work is defining you and you're not getting the results that you want in work, that's a really dangerous road to go down because then you start yeah. questioning everything about yourself you know yeah. so um, it's hard to keep that separate yeah that yeah. balance i mean yeah. so much of us if i if i lost my license or i can't imagine it. yeah i mean who would i be if i'm I not know. the doctor especially when you love what you do yeah you know like i'm sure you love what you're doing so if you weren't able to do that anymore you know it's it's what heartbreaking it's like what you're saying is true but it's like easier said than done i feel yeah. like a lot of especially men deal with this when they hit 65 and retire and then yeah. it's like I'm not working anymore who am, who am I? I sure or when the kids I mean I'm not a mother I wouldn't know but when your kids leave to go to college and all you've done is raise your children it's like yeah. a lot of like who am I now mm -hmm. so um, but it's it's also it is a it is a hard balance but I think it's so important because you kind of will lose yourself 
or you'll get discouraged and you'll quit. So, or you'll, so you, you know. your advice would be make sure that you are more than this job or this, yeah. you know, endeavor or whatever. Yeah. And then I imagine you would say, and keep going, you know, yeah. and hang in there mm -hmm. and keep yeah, doing all the right things and trust it's, that it's yeah, going to be okay. And, exactly. And that's the thing is like, I think for me, when I came out here to pursue this, I was very naive and very like, <laughs> well, I want to do this. And so therefore I'm going to be successful. The idea of it not working out for me never crossed my mind. We all have the fantasy. Right. <laughs> but it was I also, don't have the fantasy. But well, it's, it's like I mean, sure, if I, I knew then what I know now and how difficult it is and how much rejection goes into it. I would probably like be very afraid to pursue it or just be like, mm. I don't know about this. And, but I just did not ever have those worries. I was very clear that I was like, this is what I've trained my whole life to do. This is the only thing I want to do. And so therefore I'm going to be successful. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm going to make sure I do everything I can to have my dreams become a reality. Are, are you saying that if you knew it, 20 whatever what you know now you wouldn't have done it it's not that i wouldn't have done it i would have approached it with i think a little bit more fear how so how would that have because i changed what you because did? i've been able to see everything that goes into this i've been the one standing you know on one side of the camera and somebody standing on the other and making the decisions or mm -hmm. doing the casting and stuff mm -hmm. and um so much goes into it that's out of the talent's control, mm -hmm. and but I didn't. Don't I, take it I didn't know yeah. any. Of that. Yeah, all of that stuff. Like I didn't know any of the, that stuff. It was just kind of like, well, I say I want to do something. I know I'm talented, and so 400 girls is nothing to me. You know what I mean? Versus well, that served you well. I know. I know. Right. I mean, would you? Which is why I say mental is so important. Yeah. You know, the mental headspace that you hold, and and it's not to say that it's like. It's not being conceited and it's not thinking that you're better than or anything like that. I think it's it's knowing what you bring to the table and knowing that like when I'm in this space in this audition, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do the best I can. If I'm right for it, I'll hopefully book it. And if I don't, I either fell short in some way or I wasn't the right type, but I can't control my type and what they're wanting. So I can't change my height, my hair color, my ethnicity, right. my weight, any of those things, you know? So having an understanding of yourself and your worth and knowing not to take it personal, like you said, is truly half of what this is about with that, this That mindset, especially when it's such a long-term yeah. grind and yeah. with all that rejection, like, you're right, mm -hmm. so important. I'm thinking about how we talk to ourselves. When yeah. you're walking out of that rejection, what are you saying to yourself? Oh, you're not good enough. This will never happen. Da, da, da. Or like yeah. framing it like you said, you know, maybe not the right fit. Maybe I missed this. I need to work a little better. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. I'm going to get better. I'm going to stick at it the next one. And, and yeah. this is going to work out. You know, like, how, but the point is how you talk to yourself really matters, especially in the downs and the yeah. rejection. There's been times where I've left auditions and been like, I know in this moment, I did not get it. Like in the moment of the audition or doing something, I was like, I know that I'm. You mean a particular move yeah. or thing you yeah. did that screwed it was just like, yep, that up. was the moment that, that put me out of the running. One thing yeah. like that can. Yeah. yeah. Or there's been times <clears throat> where I've walked out and been like, yeah, I'm just going to wait for a call because I know I booked that. Oh, really? Yeah. And then there's other times where I've walked out and been like, I was probably to this or that. And it's a front because I know that I didn't deliver. And I'm just using an excuse of like, oh, I was yeah. probably too tall or I was probably, we've all done it, you know, because we want to justify the rejection. The truth is you weren't on your game. Right? Yeah. Or the truth thing. is, is like everybody, at least 80% of the room is capable of doing the job. And the, 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 the dancers are this big and the slots are this. Mm -hmm. So like, it's not yours. It's somebody else's, you know, like I have a really good friend. She works all the time and she just found out she wasn't going to be doing a job with an artist that she works with consistently for years. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I know it, you know, I know it burns a little bit. I was like, but that's, that opportunity is meant for somebody else. Cause you've had that opportunity before and somebody else that hasn't Again, had it. It's a mind game. Yeah. You it's have how to are you gonna, retrain your brain. What are you going to say to yourself? What's the belief that's yeah. going to come out at the end of that? And so yeah. a good one that served you say it again. What? It's meant for somebody else. You yeah, have yeah. This. It's meant for that opportunity is. You're for, meant for something mm -hmm. else now. Yeah. Better. Or whatever. Yeah. A lot of older dancers used to say to me, they would be like, "Rejection is protection." 
you know, God or the universe or whatever you believe in is protecting you from that job or that experience. Or rejection is redirection. You're supposed to be available for something else. Whether or not a job comes in at that time or whatever, I think that's the only healthy way that you can look at what I do, at least in my industry. Mm -hmm. And especially now as an actress as well, the rejection is on a much deeper level and it's on a much... Than dancing? Oh, yeah. Why? Because, you know, I can go to a... For instance, you go to a dance audition and sometimes they're like, all right, we're, we're, we're looking for 10 girls, you know? You go to an acting audition, we're looking for one girl. Mm. And that one girl has to fit all the things. Has to look right next to the rest of the cast or the, you know? And there's just not a harder as, fit. Yeah, yeah. But I would think that would be less personal. You're saying somehow it feels... Yeah. You're saying it feels more. Well, I than think the for you. the um, what I was saying is it's like the the acting industry is way more saturated than the dance industry is. So if I were like when you're like 400 or whatever, sometimes my auditions as a dancer are that I'm going up against that many dancers. Other times I'll go into a small call and it's 50 of us. But as an actress, Small I, call. yeah, 50. <laughs> but as an actress, this is nothing, I guess. it's this. like if you were to talk to a casting director, they're going to be like, yeah, we got about 1200 submissions for this one role. We probably brought in 60 and we, maybe we, maybe if that 60, I mean, that's Did a Did you big, say 1200? Oh yeah. They get like 12 to 1600, a hundred, hundred dollar, hundred submissions, it's you know? Crazy. Yeah, and they got to filter through all that. So even just to get past that point, to even be invited to audition. And then when you get invited to audition, there's probably an offer already out to a name. So it's like, there's so many things, you know. But um, It's bringing up my anxiety of (laughs) medical school acceptance, which was like the worst thing ever. Because my entire identity was like, oh. But the difference is, once you get in, that's it. There's, I mean, there's other stuff, mm-hmm. but it's not a continual audition every week, month, whatever. Yeah. That's not part. Like once you get in and get in that thing, right? Then it's just a matter of doing the training, doing and the job, being doing the thing. The gig, yeah. It's totally different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I tell Deep people breath. like imagine going on a job interview multiple times a week. That's what That's rough. my career is like for, for all these years. So, so I really like how you are modeling these. Um, healthy beliefs and mindset and talking to yourself of going through this. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, like, earlier in your career, did you say things that weren't helpful to yourself? Did you, you know, how did you mm-hmm. learn? This is a great thing for people who in this are going through this. Yeah. What are things you would avoid? And then you've said a lot of the good things that... Well, I've been able to, like, all this, when you're, like, you're saying a lot of these good things, it didn't just happen like that. There were many times where I was, like, the walls are closing in on me, like, where I got so many no's, and I'm, like, am I doing the right thing here? Like, should I just be listening to all these no's, or, like, wh- you know, and what then What does it I, mean? Does it mean I yeah, should do like, something else? Yeah, like, is this, else? am I supposed to be, um, and also, too, because as a dancer, thankfully, I'm so blessed that I've had a really nice career, But as I was transitioning out of dancing and my love for it wasn't there anymore, I had toured for many, many years and done a lot of film and TV. And I was like, I really want to like use my voice and use Mm. my thoughts. And I want to go into acting. It was like my passion was shifting into the theater, into acting. And I was not getting results the way I was getting as a dancer. Because you probably left dancing near the top and yeah. you were doing well and then yes. now you're going to do something And now totally it's like, new. and I'm going to start from the ground up at 30 years old when all these other actresses have been building their resumes since they were 16. I've built, built my resume, but as a dancer. So it's a whole other thing that I had to wrap my head around. And anytime I would question it, thankfully I would have a coach, like an acting coach being like, don't let anybody dictate your path. Like you decide, what is your heart sing for, you know? And so it was always very clear. I was like, I feel so alive when I'm in my art. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was like, okay, this is this is the road. And I just have to saddle up and go, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, but there were many times so where it was just... So when you had these questions, you kind of reconnected to like a sense of mission and purpose. Mm-hmm. And then it said saddle up. That sounded like kind of like, okay, tough. Just like, here like, we I'm go. Here. We're going to do, do this. this. Yeah. yeah. But a lot of it is like, I try to get out in nature when I feel really 
Um, like if I'm like, okay, I'm going to get into a, a dark place right now. You know what I mean? Like, let me get out in nature. Let me just change the venue. Let me write in my journal. Let me understand that life is bigger than this. And how am I serving people? How am I showing up to people? Like what is my, my life is not going to be, you know, this job or this whatever. So I've had to try to, and it's a constant practice. I'm These are still, all the ways that you yeah. recharge mm -hmm. and get perspective. Yeah, I'm still doing it, which is why I try to instill this when I'm teaching, you know? This is the stuff that you want to pass on mm -hmm. to the next generation. Yeah, because I see younger dancers being <clears throat> like, I didn't get the gold, and I'm like, it's not going to matter in five years. You know what I mean? Like, don't, don't tear yourself up and yeah. think that you are not good enough, because yeah. as dancers, we really beat ourselves up. So. I, I want to, this is great, this is great stuff. I want to go back to this two and 400 audition that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Do you remember walking into that? How you felt, what you were wearing, what the... What, I do you remember what I was What the wearing. performance even was and... Tell yeah. me how you were feeling at that then. I was feeling... You had been there for nine months? I had been there for nine months. I had done a couple of award shows. Um, a movie and so you're getting some work yeah yeah and I was just like you know okay here we go and I had been used to having being one of many dancers at the audition I knew that they needed to have a girl of a certain height and I I was that height they wanted a tall girl which is so funny because you're like, a tall girl I'm a tall girl what height how five, tall are you eight. what's not what's average in the dance world uh, if you're five six you're gonna work more okay yeah so, so at five eight you're too tall for something yes okay. yeah so there's a there was also a, like a lane that i was like okay my lane is going to be the tall girls we're going to be doing these types of jobs okay because when i moved moved out here my agent was like well you're never going to dance for an artist because you're too tall and at the time it was like christina aguilera britney spears they were all like five two and you had to kind of be oh you you would your height you would dominate her. yes and so I'm like, I've danced with like 10 artists now. You know what I mean? I'm just like, it's just crazy. That's why I'm like, don't listen to what other people are going to tell you because you make your own your own way. But um, yeah, I remember what I was wearing. I remember my roommate and what I auditioned in the same group. I think I was wearing like this black two-piece thing. It was kind of edgy. I mean, we're talking like 2003. This is a long time ago. <laughs> okay. Um, and and did you, and how did you feel going? Did you feel like this might be it, or were you like this is another audition? I felt really confident, and I also felt um, I felt the the pressure because I really needed to pay my bills. Because you had six bucks yeah. in your bank. Yeah, account. yeah, yeah, yeah. I really needed to. I, you know, I could have called my mother. She wouldn't have been like, no, hang, on, you know. But I just was like, I can't put that pressure on her. I know I called my brothers and asked them for money, and they, they were like, we don't have any money. Well, you did call your brothers. Yeah, yeah. So what were you going to do? I want to get a sense of the stakes for you. If you didn't get this job, were you going to have to go home? Were you going to have to wait tables? Were you going to, what no, were you going to do? I would have probably tried to just get like a, a side job at a studio teaching or something. So you would have had to get, but yeah. you, you were like, I don't want to do this, I but didn't you would have do done, it. so you would have had to get a job like that. And... Yeah, but that's the thing. It was just always like, this has to pan out, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, and thankfully, thankfully it did, and we went into rehearsals like the very next day. Er, you just skipped over the what? whole thing. So, so, <laughs> so, you, so I, I'm trying to get it. I want to walk in and feel how you're feeling. So the stakes are up. Yeah. You're feeling pressure, but you also feel confident. Mm -hmm. Like. When you walk in and you see all these other girls, it, or performers, um, and you're doing the tryout, I don't even know what it is, you're doing it together or whatever. Mm, yeah, you do. You, you watch As that thing audition. went, did you feel more and more confident or? I just always, like with auditions, it's like I'm used to be, I'm, as a kid I was used to auditioning on conventions, on scholarships. I'm used to being one of many auditioning for something. So when I go into auditions, I'm not looking and been like, oh, she's here, oh God. You know, I'm just really focused on making sure I remember the choreography when I'm auditioning and making sure I'm doing something that makes me stand out. Mm -hmm. My friend calls it the getcha gotcha. It's like the moment in your audition that you're gonna like grab the client's attention. And these Are these like secrets? Can you tell us a couple <laughs> of those? Well, I always tell my students, I'm like your first four counts, the first four to eight counts of your audition is the most important because it's when casting or the director is going to 
decide on whether or not they want to watch you. But you don't want to over dramatize something. You don't. You but there's hit little it, but things that you the... can do. A lot of it has to do with eye contact and confidence. Okay. It's just so. It's that simple to just look at them in the eye and not make them feel uncomfortable. But there is there's a sense of of essence that comes over you with just true confidence. Wow. Like I have something that you want, and that's a thing too. Is like. So often we go into auditions, and I still do this, and you're like, I hope I get it, right? Or I hope they like me, mm -hmm. versus they need what we have, right? So it's all this mindset. Totally, stuff. totally. So as I started working more as a dancer, I started to get a lot more confident, obviously, and um, you know, once you get work under your belt, you you go into you go into audition rooms a lot differently. You know, yeah, I'm sure. um, you go in as a working as a working artist and not somebody who's trying to get a job. Yeah, little little swag to you. Yeah, but like there's little tiny things that you can do to make you stand out in a really smart way, and it's about just being a smart dancer and making smart bold choices. Now I'm I'm thinking about. I mean, this is this like even applies when you're walking in a Anything. room or an interview yeah. or this kind of just confidence, mm -hmm. kind of going with confidence. Do, do you remember when they called you? How did you find out that you had gotten this? I don't really remember, but I, I remember being in our apartment and my roommate was up in our loft at the time. And I was like, I just got put on a veil. And she's like, you did. And then she was like, I just got put on a veil. And we were like, oh my <laughs> God, we hope we get to do it together. And if we can't, then we hope one of us at least. What, what do you you wouldn't have gone together? I thought you both got it. So when you get when you get put on a veil, it's like, hold that, hold your dates, we oh, might wanna book you. It's maybe. Mm-hmm, yeah, and it's okay. it's probably, if they, like for instance, they were hiring two girls, they maybe put, you know, five or six on a veil. Oh, Yeah. so it's yeah. not a sure bet. It's not a sure bet until you you're get, booked. Do you get paid at that no. point or no? No. Oh, so that's not even, yeah. so when did you get booked? Uh, I think we got booked like the very next day. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you just like, it's it's usually what it is, is like the choreographer, the client's like, we like these girls. Let's send them to the artist or let's send them to the director and see. see for a final approval. I see. Um, so it's kind of a, a process. So anytime, and, and that's a hard thing too, is you get your avail checked and you're like, I could potentially be doing this job. And then you either get a call if you booked it or like they released you. And you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's like we're going to dangle the carrot, show you what you could. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I finally told my commercial agents, I was like, don't tell me when I'm on a veil for a commercial because I just can't take it anymore when they release me. <laughs> so. Makes sense. Yeah. What Do you remember what that show was? Which show? The, this one, the one that got you that big booking. Oh, it was, um, it was a tour with a Latin artist. His name is Cheyenne. And he was like... He's like the Michael like Jackson of the Latin world. Yeah, he's huge. We I've would do like to that stuff. Yeah, he's been around. He was in Oh my god, what was the the one with Ricky Martin and all them the the, the what? The, the 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 young boys in, in the um, movie? No, they were like a boy group in Puerto Rico when Menudo. they were kid. What is it? Menudo. Yes, he was in Menudo. And uh Well done, Nicole. Yeah. <laughs> and he's he's an amazing guy and he's just like you know, huge out there. We would perform for like 80,000 people in these huge soccer stadiums. Did he stadiums. do Torero? Yes. That's why I know that. Yes. That was 20 years ago. Oh, he's that been was, around forever. Did you dance to that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was part of your thing. Yeah. I remember yeah, hearing did, that like, when I was in... Yeah, flamenco and all that. I remember hearing that when I was in Spain yeah. at Feria in Seville mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. It was crazy. Anyway. So I did two years with him. Two years? Yeah. All, all over my, the world? All my tours were two years. Like all over the world or the U.S.? Mostly South America, South Central America, a little of Europe. We spent a lot of time in Spain. Oh, fun. He went to Australia. Did you like the traveling? Yeah, yeah. But uh, after my third tour, I was like, I think I'm good. That's a long time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you like the music? I did. I was like... I was always like, I don't know what you're singing about, but I love it. And <laughs> I was I'm like say, backstage, like you... screaming at the top of my lungs. I'm like, I don't know what any of this means. And I would ask him and he'd be like, it doesn't mean the same in English. I can't translate it for you. It won't, it won't, it won't be as good in English. But yeah. Oh yeah. We would all sing backstage and just have not a clue. Terreros, yeah. bullfighter, I believe. Yes. Yeah. That's funny. So you did not hablar espanol. No. I mean, I was good enough to like, you know, get by in restaurants and like get by when I needed to, but sure. I wasn't fluent by any means. 
I want to ask you a little bit about around this moment and before and ask you about your dad and some mm -hmm. of that stuff and kind of like what was going on for you emotionally mm -hmm. a little bit then. Mm -hmm. um, and then some of the other stuff that we were curious about, you know, you had talked about height and your own body. Mm -hmm. Is there like in, in dancing, Yeah. how much anorexia is there and body issues and pressure to conform and like what do you especially tell younger generations mm -hmm. about that like this mm -hmm. is big stuff yeah you know it is there I don't know as if it's as much of a thing in the commercial dance world as it is as you would see in the ballet world right um, is, is ballet more notorious for that yes yeah from what I yeah but if you were to turn on your television and look at any any dance scene whether it's on television or film or in music videos or award shows, I think we're seeing a lot of diversity in, in terms of shapes and sizes right now. And a lot of it too is like sometimes you have to be a character and you have to be a mom or you have to be, you know, whatever, whatever the job calls for. So I always just like to tell dancers, especially because I get asked this question a lot and it's funny because, well, it's not funny, but <laughs> I have a intensive that I, I have a company that I own myself and we travel to studios around the world and we teach like these two-day intensives that are kind of like what I was telling you a mm -hmm. convention style but in a much mm -hmm. more intimate setting mm -hmm. and I always do a Q&A at the end of the two days with parents and teachers mm -hmm. and I often get the parents that ask about the weight and I'm like in my head I'm like Why? what what do they ask what's their question they say like how much is body image a factor and I understand the concern there as a parent especially if they're seeing their kid become a little neurotic in They're terms of... They're worried about yeah, the effect of, of dance culture on their yeah. weight. So and you know, I'm always like, you have to feel healthy. You have to look healthy and you also have to take care of your body in a healthy way. And what does that mean to you? That means eating really clean, nutritious foods that give you energy, right? Working out so that you, so that you feel strong, so mm -hmm. that when you're dancing, you're not getting injured. Or when you're being lifted, you're able to carry your own weight, mm -hmm. you know, with your partner and things like that. So, um, and I have, a, I have a good friend of mine, she's all about nutrition and like what you feed your body and why you feed it and how we look at food and everything like that. And I learned so much from her as well. And she is a huge advocate in our community about sharing that with the younger generation. But I mean, I definitely struggled with it in college because it was a thing. Our grade was dependent on our weight. Yeah, what? our scholarship was dependent on making a certain number on the scale, yeah. If you didn't hit the number, then what? then you'd lose your scholarship. No. Or your grade was affected. It wasn't just weight, but it was also like, what level are you are you in at this point? What's your weight at Doesn't this point? Doesn't that sound... It's bananas. Yeah. <laughs> and what it, what unfortunately, and I understand the... What was the reasoning? That sounds so crazy. Their reasoning is, is, is you have to be fit. And when you get into the professional world, you can't be overweight, right? That was their whole thing. Um, and there is some truth to that. Yeah, you have to be fit. You have to be able to fit in costumes and, and, and all these things. But the downside of that is when I was, what I, what was something that I noticed in myself when I got to LA and I would see somebody that didn't fit into that cookie cutter frame that, that I was taught that they had to fit in, then I automatically assumed that they weren't as talented. And then I would see them dance and be blown away by their talent. And I'm like, I can't believe I was making assumptions based off of weight, how awful of me to even mm. have that and, and where did that come from you know and so it's kind of like retraining what was taught to me um, and so that's why I'm just like I and then I look at myself and I'm like I know when I feel my best and it's when I'm eating well and when I'm working out and working on my body and working on my stamina mm -hmm. and when I get on a job and I and I'm not cringing when they're when they send me into wardrobe because I've definitely been you know your weight especially as women we mm -hmm. fluctuate mm -hmm. there's times where I've walked into wardrobe fittings and been like I feel so good you could put me in anything and other times I walk in and I'm like can I have the thing that's going to cover me up the most you know you don't feel comfortable because you're heavier yeah Is that because what you maybe mean? I'm a little heavier or I wasn't you know taking care you know whatever whatever it might be yeah um and so, yeah, I know this is a whole other topic. Oh, it's so good though. Yeah, but and, and, and just like just my little medical. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Like, like you know, like the number one um, mental disease young women die from is anorexia. Is it really? It's not. That's so it's sad. It's not even alcohol or 
schizophrenia or what it's, it's anorexia. It's very relevant. And I think, and I wonder, you would be the expert in this, but like so much it has to do with control. And if you can't control sure. certain things, what can you control? Absolutely. I can control what I eat and I can control how, at least how I look. Or sometimes if, you know, I, yeah, I don't well, know. This, and this thing. is where exactly what you're saying intersects right there with what you were saying before. You get rejected. You're walking away like, was I'm I, not this enough, was that I enough, that thin enough, enough yeah. X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. And that could easily go that way. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what the reality is today. Ballet is one thing. The more dancing you're more f familiar with. Yeah. It sound, sounds like it's, it's complicated. I'm sure yeah. a certain weight you perform the best, you mm -hmm. know, and to be... Both sides, yeah. too thin or too heavy, yeah. you're not going to be mm -hmm. able to do the moves and so forth. And but but I think the thing that <clears throat> most people would kind of point at is there still is this obsessed ideal over skinny. Yeah. And I think that's changing a little I think so bit, too. right? Strong's the new mm -hmm. pretty kind of mm -hmm. thing. An athlete, like an athletic build, is is really beautiful. But so that's my question: is in your dance world, yeah. to what extent is skinny still valued like you grew out of this mentality 15 or 20 years ago when you saw dancers mm -hmm. that were great and weren't skinny but your initial thing was like oh yeah she's probably not as good is that well, still a thing it's still a thing like sometimes i get auditions and the breakdown is like must be in great condition super fit translation yeah okay so i've got to be cut yeah. or you know um low body fat percentage. yeah yeah totally or like some jobs you go out on if it's like say i'm just throwing it out there but like say it's a showgirl type of a role okay think of what you think of when you think of a showgirl she's tall and very lean mm. she's wearing xyz clothes her kicks. midriff is showing so yeah. she's got to have if not abs but very very low percentage body fat you know lean. and there's certain shows that I have auditioned for where they've been like, we need you, we need girls in tip top shape because this is the role that we're trying to fit. Meaning you didn't, you were cut because you weren't I lean don't, there were There were times where I've gotten those jobs and then times where I haven't and I could rack my brain about how, why I didn't get that, but I don't, I choose to not even go there. I'm like, what am I gonna gain from picking myself apart to figure out why I might not get something when I don't know why and, I didn't get and, it? And, but you can see the seduction of that. Yeah, in that. yeah. And I think it's because I've been on the other side and I've been somebody that's involved in the casting or the choreography mm -hmm. process. And there's been times where, you know, the client will be like, I love this girl and she's so right, but we already have that girl and then the, they're, they're too much alike and we can't have two redheads or wh whatever it is. Yeah. So you see how it's truly has nothing to do with them personally. And sometimes it does. Like sometimes it's like, yeah, she's just not good enough. Or he's just not, you know. Sure. But you just, as the talent, you just don't know, and so there's no use in racking that, your brain about it. Isn't terrible? Like they never really. They never give you a reason. And tell you what, because a lot of times the real reason is garbage. You I know? know. I've asked actually a couple of times. I've been confused as to why I didn't get something. You know, you think you're so right for it, and I've asked like whether it was the assistant. I'd be like, if you can give me any feedback so that I can fix it for the next time, or why this might be. And then, you know, they'll shed some light or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I've actually asked a couple of times because I've been like, I genuinely want to know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It makes me, th I always think about medicine and stuff. And, and I've applied to things, been rejected, mm -hmm. got into med school. Yeah. And then I've also sat on admissions committees. Yeah. That is much more fair in the sure. sense where it's like, why didn't I get in? Because there were 700 people that had better grades, better yeah. scores, and better everything than you. <laughs> like, yeah. A lot of it is people just easily stratify based on this, you know, arbitrary mm -hmm. system we've come up with mm -hmm. about grades and scores. Yeah, and, and I and I know that I've talked a lot about like you can't take it personal, and so much of it is out of your control. But it is also not getting something is also feedback. So it's like, okay, what? Where did I potentially fall short so that that doesn't happen again? So that the next audition I perform better or you know what I mean so it's like it's that fine line of okay let's not take it personal but also why wasn't I in that mix no it's exactly right you the, know there what's the phrase there is no failure only feedback mm. Mm, which is exactly cool. what you're saying I I have thought about this with patience with weight loss and it's taking your 
the the personal self-esteem stuff out of it and yeah. just going okay this is what happened in the last month or a couple of weeks you ate x you know and and exercise y and this right. is the result this right. is the feedback that's mm-hmm. it that's all mm-hmm. it is it's not you know yeah. you're lovable and all this other stuff wrapped into it yeah it's not failure it's just feedback and and mm. learning from things I like, that. like that it's hard to yeah. separate all it that it takes but. time to just like get to a place of that mindset. So when you were talking about um, your moment, you brought up your dad. Mm-hmm. Um, we share that in common. I lost my mother when I was oh, early sorry. 20s. I know, it's the worst. Yeah. It was um, unfortunate. 18 years yesterday. <sighs> Isn't that crazy? Wow. Or today? No. What's today? I know. Isn't it funny how you never forget the date? It's today. I never forget the date. It's 18 years today. Oh my God. My... 2001? Yeah. Yeah, same for me. Mm-hmm. April. Crazy. Yeah. What happened? Um, you know, he was, he, uh, uh, he had liver cirrhosis. Yeah. And so that was unfortunate. Alcohol? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um. How old was he? 40 51. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You, were you in Oklahoma? Yeah, I was a freshman in college. He had, he had gotten a bit... And they were in Boston? Yeah, he had... Yes, we got a call that he was not doing well. Had he been sick for a while? Or? I'm sure. You, you, yeah. This doesn't just pop up, you know? Yeah. So, um... We, we, I, I, we don't need to talk <laughs> I probably about, won't go in detail. About yeah, it. we don't need to yeah. talk about the details. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was a freshman in college. Yeah. Freshman in college. Mm -hmm. And how long after that did you, so I'm curious how losing him at that Mm -hmm. time affected Mm -hmm. you, what you did, where you went. To be honest with you, I'm not sure I fully really processed it at that time. I don't know if that was the same for you. Um, I'm still processing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those really hard things to like wrap your head around and then there would be times where I would just like lose all emotional control on my own and just have my moments of like just crying, you know, and like victim mentality of like, I don't have a dad, you know what I mean? But then mm-hmm. it wasn't until, and this was a really beautiful moment for me, but it was about five or six years <clears throat> ago that I actually really came to terms with his passing. and really was okay with it meaning what and in just a sense of like i don't feel i feel like he is fully experiencing his children now in a way that he wouldn't have been able to if he were alive and if that sounds crazy to some people but that's truly what i feel and that gives me peace gives you a sense of peace yeah yeah you know i mean i like he used to come to my dance recitals and everything and somebody said to me once oh now he has the best seat in the house and i was like totally for 18 years, he's had the best seat in the house for all myself, yeah. my brothers, my mother, you know? Yeah. So that's the thing that allowed me to just like have a little bit of peace and be okay with it and and not feel like this thing of like, oh, everybody gets to have, you know, both parents. And I know that's not true. A lot of people don't have both parents and a lot of people have had awful things happen. Um, so I know that I'm not the only one that's lost a parent, obviously, yeah. but like, you know, this feeling of like, I would have like loved to have, you know, had my father in my life, you know? So, um, but I feel like he's still there, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and able to like see and experience more than he would have if he were alive, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't know. That's how I, I was like this moment that I, yeah, had about six years ago. Man, it's, a. Uh hearing you talk about that and have having found a way to kind of come to peace with that boy i it's hard no i it, i i think the thing that has been the hardest for me to let go of is especially when you're young and you have all these um dreams really mm-hmm. oh i'm going to get married and have kids and whatever yeah. and they're going to know my your mom and dad your babies and yeah. Gonna, yeah yeah and like my daughter is nine. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna cry, and that's the saddest thing mm-hmm. that she'll never know my mm. mother. Yeah. So when I go home for the holidays, like one of the things I'm gonna do is sit down with her best friend and be like, 
let's do some pictures. Yeah. Let's teach her about it a little bit. Like, yeah. Especially at that age now, too. Yeah, she's totally. She gets it a little more, yeah. but but the core of the loss and the pain is all these things you just assume mm -hmm. and you see and you want, and then it's not happening. It's right. gone. Like that's right. yeah. the loss, and it oh, hurts. Oh yeah, I think about that. I'm like, if I were to get married one day, and what hurts. that would be like, or my babies, who's you know, who's walking you down the like, yeah. who's walking you down the aisle? Yeah. Like when I see these, I love weddings. And when it's time for the mother-son dance, sometimes mm -hmm. I leave for a minute. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't yeah, yeah. Lose it. Yeah. You know? Sure. I think about all that. I'm like, would I dance with my mom? Would I dance with my brothers? <laughs> would I, you know, like, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I still feel it. I still feel it too. I mean, I still <clears> think <throat> about him often, but that shift in my, in my emotions around it really helped me process and come to peace with with it it makes sense yeah I was I was talking about talking with some of this stuff with a friend and and she's like oh she's very present and she's right here and all this and I'm like I just don't believe that yeah. stuff I wish yeah. I did yeah you know what I mean like, yeah but um, I guess whatever works for anybody that no I whatever I, works for them to I mean, I kind of wish I believed what you did. I just I don't know if that's how it is. You know. Listen, if somebody had said that to me when it just happened, I'd been like, what? You know. And it was also like I just grew up, and you just kind of like stuffed a lot of things, and you just kept going, you know. And this I don't know if it's an East Coast mentality as well, but it was like a lot of my therapy was through dance. So if something wasn't going, I would just mm -hmm. like not talk about it and just go into the studio and work it out. And so there was many of moments of that, but then there's only so much that that will do. Yeah. And then you got to face your stuff totally I, I um gosh survival and distraction and mm -hmm. comes up at these moments but then, then there'll be these like huge things where it's like why am I having such a hard time saying goodbye to this person yeah <laughs> yeah because you haven't finished saying goodbye to somebody more important and mm -hmm. it's hitting that nerve you yeah know? sure so there's these ways that it still goes what what was that? How did that? I mean, did that affect any parts of this story for you in college and when you came to California? Well, and... it was more like okay, life is now. Like this whole thing of of like you know, it was more like a sense of urgency came over me, and a sense of like a little bit more of fire came in because I was just like, I want to live my life and I want to be happy, and that was, you know, and I would look back and be like, where am I the happiest? What am I doing? What, what state am I in when I'm happy? And I remember speaking to one of my brothers. I was like, I'm not happy in school. And he was just like, well, you have control of your happiness. If you're not happy, change something. What would make you happy? And I was like, I want to move to LA. He's like, then do it. And so I picked up the phone, called my mom, told her she was fine. She didn't budge with me so at all. So you figured this out with your brother. Yeah. But I wasn't, I wasn't happy for in college for a while. I stayed there for the social aspect of it, for the did, friendships. Did you leave college early to pursue yeah. this? Yeah. And you didn't finish no. the performing? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. I, I was during my summers i was i was u-hauling out here why weren't like you happy in driving. college what was that about um it was more like i just all i wanted to start my career and i was just not Felt like you were waiting to yeah, do what you really yeah. wanted and to I, do i had had a couple of job offers right out of high school and one of my mentors was like, you need to go to college just for a couple of years and just like ex feel what that feels like to be, you know, in a sorority if you want or just like the, the experience. Yeah, just get the experience of that. And I was already in I was already living in New York on, on my own. So it's it, like being is, independent wasn't. Is there a reason to do that for dancing? Oh, go to college. It'll make you a better dancer. Well, that's the thing. I think, and I get asked this a lot from parents and students, should I go to college, should I not? And I'm like, that's case specific, depends. you know? It depends on where you're at emotionally, mentally, financially. Do you have the support from your family that you would need? Um, are you gonna be doing this on your own? I have friends that moved out to Los Angeles at 17 and pursued a career professionally, and they're very successful. I have friends that went all the way to college. For me, I went to a university um, it's a great school. They have a great program. Just for me, I was like, I, I need more, you know, and I was majoring in dance and I didn't need a dance degree. 
I would if I wanted to teach at a university, but I yeah. knew I didn't want that. Yeah. And unfortunately, where I was going, you couldn't minor in anything. They didn't allow you to, and you were dancing constantly. So I was like, I could be doing this and getting paid and like <laughs> doing jobs. And so... Um, Sounds like that made more sense. Yeah, yeah. And when it, because I was able to come out here during the summers, I was like... Kind of planning my feet. I was like yeah. building my community. I was taking class with choreographers. I was um, signed with an agency and they're like, when you're ready to fully move out, you're, you know, we're here. And so it was kind of an easy, easier transition for me because I was slowly getting my feet wet over the course of two years. So you went to college for two years? Yeah. I, 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 and then I came out here in the middle of my junior year. So your dad passes freshman year. Freshman year, yeah. You continue through sophomore year and mm -hmm. then at some point junior year. Yeah. I think the first month of junior year, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> My mom was like, just finish the semester out. I did that, and then I moved. What were, what were some of the, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, like when he passed, what were some of the things that you took from that? I think you were saying like you had this sense of urgency and... Well, yeah, like... Are there, I, are there like... Like somebody dies, we have this intense experience, and then you, you have like these conclusions, like these beliefs, these seeds are planted. I don't, th honestly. No. And I don't know how it was for you, but like at 18, you're like, what just happened? Yeah. You know? And like, I, I couldn't really wrap my head around what, what was going on. It was like, I got to get back to school because like, I'm going to, if then I'm going to fail this semester, I'll have to repeat the semester. So I was like, let me just handle my stuff, you know? So, but I do remember being like, okay, nothing is guaranteed. You know, life is not guaranteed. And so I want to just check in and, with myself and be like, where am I happy right now? I want to only, I want to do the things that make me happy. And so... Do you want to do the things that make you happy? And be where I know I'm happy. And I wasn't happy in college. And so that was the sense of like, that was the trigger. Kind of one of these, life can be short, nothing's yeah. guaranteed. Yeah. If I'm not happy in college mm -hmm. doing this, like, I'm going to make a change. Mm -hmm. And I think at a young age, too, it's like kind of like what I was saying earlier is like we don't have all these life experiences, you know, at 18 or 19 that we do at 37 years old. Right. So we don't necessarily have fears yet in, in those ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like one foot in front of the other. I remember being like in September, I remember being like, OK, January 31st, I'm going to drive out to L.A. On the 31st, I drove out to L.A. You know, it's just kind of like. I'm always somebody that's like, when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. So if I, I knew if I claimed that I was going to do it, I had to live up to that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was like, I wish I could say that it was like, I just had this big aha moment. I know when it happened, I was like, okay, this, this is going to change me. And, and I need to like look at my life and figure out what's going to make me the, the happiest right now. And so that was the deciding factor for me. Um, and so that was, that's why when you asked about the moment, I was like, I know that was a huge moment, you know? And then career-wise, the other moment for, was, was that. So you, your dad passes, you're in school, you're not really liking that. It sounds like it kind of built your sense of, I am not happy doing this. Yeah. And then you get to some point and even on a conversation with your brother, and you're mm -hmm. like, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sure of it. January 31st, I'm going to California. Yeah. And yeah. Then that. But that, this conversation with your brother almost is like... That was a thing. That's like the moment when you're like, I'm going to California, yeah. and I'm going to pursue this thing. That mm -hmm. Yeah. It was happy. always the dream to pursue it. It was always the thought that I would it's be like, in New no. York. But... I had been exposed to LA and I was like, I want that life. I want that weather. Oh, you want that life? Oh, this was more than well, just this was, dance. Well, it was like, listen, New York, you got the four seasons, you've got, you know, winter for all those things. It's I was cold. like, okay, so I can be by the beach and I was building a community of friends and I liked the lifestyle at the time. Yeah. It still is cheaper than New York, you know? Yeah. Um, and I was, I remember being like, I'm probably going to struggle the first year. I don't want to struggle in New York. I'd rather struggle here. The quality of life is different, you know, so. Um, All of that kind yeah. of pointed uh -huh. to California for yes. you. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Okay, let's ask some fun dance questions. Sure. Just whatever comes to mind. Okay. Um, your favorite kind of dance to perform yourself? 
I like lyrical and jazz. The worst costume you've ever had to wear. Oh my god. For dance. A Fred Flintstone costume. It was so big. The why, head was so heavy. Why were you so Fred heavy. Flintstone? Not that you couldn't pull it off. I was tall. I forgot what the job was. It was for Viacom. Some job for Viacom. I was 18. Yeah. Fred Flintstone. <laughs> I'm sure there's several others, but yeah. Pinnacle. Of, that was the pinnacle of yeah. your dance career. Um, most proud moment dancing? I've gotten to do two Super Bowl halftime shows, so that for oh. me was... Which ones? Um, I did Beyonce's first one, um, and she did her own, with, and then brought out Destiny's Child. Where was that one? That was in New Orleans. And then uh, I did the one with Katy Perry. Fun. Yeah. So, like, walking out onto the stadium, that's a whole other... That's a Tell whole me about that. Thing. That sounds crazy. It's crazy. Is it, is it all dark and then it lights up? No, I mean, you do, you do a lot of rehearsal. I mean, we did weeks and weeks of rehearsal for both. Weeks? A month? Oh, Two months? Over a month. Yeah, over a month. I think we did five or six weeks for both artists. They're at the Super Bowl place, so you're actually no, at... No, no. Um, for, for Beyonce's, we were in New Orleans on a different... They built a soundstage kind of thing. Um, and then for Katie, we were here in L.A. But then when you go, you have a couple of days to rehearse, like, in the stadium, you know? And there's a whole, like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, you know, how they get... Like, do you ever wonder, how do they build that stage in yes. that commercial break? Yes. So it's, it's so many volunteers and so many hands, and that alone is a choreography piece in itself, Production. you know? Yes, and it's, like, it's just crazy. So just, like, going, you know, that, that moment of of, okay, commercial break, go. Everything is being, you know, flown in. And then, uh, you know, we rehearse at the stadium several times before the actual show. But it's the most nerve-wracking I've ever been. <laughs> the Super Bowl performance was the most, like... Oh, by far. Why? Because it's on TV, it's live. so big. It's live. It's so many people are watching. And you're, you know, with film and TV, if you mess up, it's like you get a million, you get a million takes. You know, I mean, you obviously don't want to mess up on camera, but you also know that they're they're hitting you from multiple angles. They're shooting one dance scene all day. You know, for this Stakes you get one are the shot. Highest. Yeah, you get one shot. You can't mess up. How'd yeah. you do? We did good. I mean, we did, we did well both times. But I I remember like um, even for Katie's like there was a moment where I just had to like simply walk next to her. I was like, I don't think I've ever been so nervous to walk. Because I just was like wanting to make sure that I didn't trip. You weren't or didn't... even dancing yet, but. Yeah, yeah. There was like, yeah, I don't know. And even to this day, like I just did the Billboard Awards. And it had been a moment since I had done a live performance. And I was like, oh my God, I am nervous. And this should be like second nature to me. Because I've done this so many times. Even still you get But nervous. I loved that I got nervous. Because yeah. I was like, it means I still care. It means I still love this. And it means that like... <laughs> I care if I mess up. And you're you know? still afraid. That yeah, you when you're right off the artist. Up, yeah. yeah, and you know what the shot's gonna be. It's like don't don't hijack the situation and overthink it and mess up. Yeah. Do you? This is funny. I. It's like I want to watch your next performance on what. I don't remember the last time I watched a Billboard Awards. Yeah. But I'd be like, oh, I'd watch you. Yeah. Is this stuff on your Instagram and like? Yeah, I have a whole. Do you um, have a bunch of your on my website? I've got um my my dance reel, which is pretty much. It's, it's not. It doesn't have the most updated work from the last year and a half. Fun to watch. But yeah, it's. Where it, can people find you? They can find me on Instagram, and my website is. What's on, your Instagram? It's Rachel Markarian. Rachel Markarian. And um, my website is on there. And what is your website? Let's just say it's that right now. RachelMarkarian.net. Dot net. Yeah. RachelMarkarian.net. Yes, and my Rachel is spelt. A E L. Um, yes. Um, but yeah, I have my dance reel on there, and that's my whole body of work that I just wanted to have for my own my own self to be able to show my to, grandkids hopefully one day. fun to check out <laughs> yeah yeah well um let me ask you a couple more questions what are you most what are you looking forward to most um, these days just i love to teach now i really love um just connecting with the younger generation and hopefully being a source of inspiration to them um so i'm really passionate about that i'm passionate about you know, my acting and where I get to go with that. I started writing, which makes me really excited because I've always had these ideas and I've always written down short stories or scenes, you know, or things like that. And um, 
you know, my manager was like, just write, write a feature, like just get your ideas out, just keep, you know. So I was like, okay, I've always had these characters in my head that I want to talk about. All and these new things going from the successful dance into new endeavors. Yeah, yeah. Still being the master teacher. Yeah, I really love teaching. So is yeah, so I teach for this company called CLI and they're based in LA. And then what happens is they film me and I live stream into studios across the country. Oh wow. They have lots of really wonderful LA teachers that work for them. Oh, and so if there's a studio in New York it's like we want to take a jazz class from so and so they can they have a projection screen at their studio. I've got a camera in front of me and I stream live into them. Can you teach us like one move? <laughs> you guys, I'm so injured right now. I have this insane back injury, so I can't, but <laughs> I've had a back injury for like nine months. Now. I hope you get better. I do too. What's I, wrong with your back? I have a 17 millimeter slip disc between my L4 and L5. You have a lumbar herniated disc. It's, yeah. I had a, I met with a stem cell doctor and had a PRP procedure and it's helping, but it's a slow, process. I mean, I could not even walk two or three months ago. You're recovering. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just taking the rest of the year to nurture my body. Um, you got to take care of yourself. This was great. <laughs> I had a good time. <laughs> I got cut off. I could keep going. Thank you for coming here. This, I appreciate your, yeah. your conversation and everything yeah. you've shared. And thank you. So we have a tradition here where the guest right over to that guy closes us out. Whatever feels natural to you to oh, say gosh. to the camera to All say right. goodbye. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. And um, keep tuning in. You can find Rachel at rachelmarkarian.net and on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Thank you for watching the show. Hope you loved it. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. And if you or someone you know has a moment that you think we should bring him on the show and talk about it, reach out to me, Dr. Larry Burchette, on social media. We'll see you next time. Every day I go to work, I can't stand it. I hate how I feel about the way I look. I mean, this is what I got in practice. I hate, I mean, it's literally the word hate. I, I, I hate the way I look. I don't like what I see when I look in the mirror. We have got to get better about